Ghosts from the past were returning at the margins in England too. In August 1999, a farmer in Norfolk called Tony Martin shot two burglars who were travellers. He killed one of them called Fred Barris. Tony Martin was a recluse. He lived in a remote half-ruined building called Bleak House. Tony Martin considered himself a victim. He'd been plagued by burglars for years. He lived in squalid conditions, paranoid about being burgled. The stairs of the house were booby-trapped. He slept fully dressed with his boots on and a gun by his bed. Martin was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment. His conviction touched off a wave of protest. On the surface, it was about Martin's right to defend himself. But it also expressed a much wider feeling that was simmering under the surface. That the very institutions that were supposed to protect the people, the law, the police and the politicians, were now being turned against them. A growing sense that you couldn't trust those in power any longer. What began to be called the elites. The Labour government was shocked by the anger that burst out. Tony Blair wrote in a private memo simply, we have lost touch. But what Blair and the other modern politicians had forgotten was that that suspicion of the elites did not come out of nowhere. It had its roots back in Britain's past, at the moment when the empire was collapsing. And Tony Martin himself was a direct link back to that anger. In the 1950s, Martin's uncle had been a leading member of a group called the League of Empire Loyalists. The League were powerful because some of their members were at the heart of the Conservative Party. They were convinced that there was a global conspiracy to destroy the British Empire. It was being run by bankers in America, working together with communists in Russia. But they also believed that many of those in charge in Britain were also involved in this conspiracy, including most politicians. Well, my reasons for joining the Empire Loyalists are many, but they largely stem from the fact that I believe in the thesis of nationalism, national independence, as opposed to internationalism, which I consider would in time devolve into a world government, which would of necessity, by sheer weight of numbers, become a communist-controlled world government, with the control of the world vested in the hands of very few people. This would be a tyranny. And I consider the only way to combat this possibility of a tyranny is to encourage a nation for nationality. And that anger was about to return. By now, politicians in the West had given large amounts of their power away. What had begun with Bill Clinton in the early 1990s had spread. When Tony Blair came to power, he had immediately given control over much of the economy to the Bank of England. But in 1998, the global financial system showed how unstable it could be. An economic crisis that began in Russia and then spread to Asia had consequences throughout the world. In response to the crisis, the Bank of England had insisted that interest rates be raised. But this made many British goods too expensive to export. And in the north of England, factories began to close. Tony Blair insisted, though, that it was a price the country had to pay for being part of what he called the world economy. You can say world economy till he's blue in the face, but it's not just us, is it? It's other people. He can say, Mr Blair can he say, can world, say economy. It's world economy. You can say oh, world economy, world economy, but... So what do you people say? People in the North East are suffering, but why is he giving all that power to the Bank of England? Why? Well, you know, what, why, why is that? Is he passing the book? What's he doing? So he can't be blamed for things like this that go wrong. You can say, oh, well, it's the Bank of England's interest rates and all the rest of it. I don't know.
they're just opening their mouths and letting the wind waffle their tongues about as far as I'm concerned. Get up here and get things sorted. You vote the Labour government in, you vote for them all your life and this is the crap you get off them. Do you think it's all wrong what's happened? What could they have done? Give us more support, stepped in, go put a, put a shoulder behind us, show a bit more muscle. Just let them know that they can't do this. And at the end of the century, a new anger began to grow out in the margins of England that in the future would get mixed up with the furies of the past. But the politicians increasingly found that there was little they could do to respond to this anger. Because over the past 10 years, all kinds of new organisations had grown up that were deliberately designed to limit the politicians' power. Because national politics was dangerous to the stability of the global system. The idea had originally come from technocrats inside the European Union. One of the leaders was a political scientist called Gian Domenico Maione. Politicians, Maione said, were always driven by short-term, self-interested motives, which meant that they too were irrational. The solution, he said, was to bypass the politicians completely. Is there any problem with the Pact of Stability? Vous avez-vous des problèmes avec le pacte de stabilité? Pas tellement. And in the 1990s, behind the scenes of the political debate in the European Union, Mayoni and a group of technocrats created a range of new institutions that were deliberately designed to avoid political interference and instead run large areas of society in a rational way. Mayone gave them a boring bureaucratic name. He called them non-majoritarian institutions. But in reality, they were a completely radical invention that challenged the very idea of democracy. These new organizations, Mayone said, are by design not directly accountable to voters or to their elected representatives. Out of it was going to come the massive range of new bureaucracies that today run large parts of the modern world. Not just central banks, but all kinds of regulatory agencies, special courts and expert bodies. All of which govern not through political policies, but through rational scientific assessment and measured outcomes. And the European Union became the center of this experiment. In front of House, the elected politicians debated subjects like human rights, but continually failed to come to any conclusion. Noi dobbiamo apprestare una serie di garanzie, una serie di protezioni per i cittadini. Are we concerned with rights or with political objectives? And much of what we're going to discuss today is. Personnellement, je pense que les femmes méritent d'avoir deux articles dans la charte, pas un seul. But quietly, behind the scenes, what were being created were, in Mayone's words, specialized institutions staffed with neutral experts, carrying out policies with a level of efficiency and effectiveness politicians cannot and never will achieve. The original idea behind mass democracy had been that the politicians would be the bridgehead for the people into power. They would challenge the powerful groups at the top of society on behalf of the people. But then the people, driven by the new individualism, had retreated into their own private worlds. So the politicians switched sides and became instead the representatives of the new powerful technocratic class. It still looked like they were powerful and had control over events. But now the people had gone. Beneath them was a void. But in 1999, 
Tony Blair realised that there might still be a way to change the world dramatically and recapture some of that power. The conflict between the Serbs and the Muslims in the Balkans had erupted again. Serbian nationalists were attacking the Albanian population in Kosovo. Blair worked hard to persuade a reluctant President Clinton to join in a bombing campaign to force the Serbs to stop the ethnic cleansing. And it succeeded. Tony Blair came to Kosovo and was welcomed as a hero. At the refugee camp, Blair presented what they had done as an expression of that epic vision that Werner Kuchner had put forward 20 years before. We are all one world, linked together simply as individuals, not divided by political ideas, or by nations. And we, the good politicians in the West, have a duty to intervene, to help the victims of all evil dictators, wherever they are in the world. This is not a battle for territory. This is a battle for humanity. It is a just cause. It is a rightful cause to make sure that these people, innocent people, who have been driven from their homes at the point of a gun, are allowed by the world community, acting together, back to their homeland, back to Kosovo, so these people can become symbols of hope, humanity and peace. Thank you. And the new ruler of the independent Kosovo, appointed by the United Nations, was Bernard Kuchner. We were taking significant step towards stability and democratic self-government in Kosovo. In the 1990s, the triumph over communism had ushered in a new era. Liberal politicians in the West had willingly given up much of their power in the interests of the greater good, of global stability. The power had gone first to the global financial system. And now it was being given to the American military as well. It looked like a new world. But underneath, the old forces of money and military power were reassembling and resuming their dominance, just as they had in the pre-democratic days of the old empires. And that was going to lead to other strange forces rising up and coming back to haunt the West. <laughs> 